Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Main Street Wyoming is made possible by Kennecott Energy Company. Proud to be part of Wyoming's future in the coal and uranium industries, which includes exploration, mining, and production. And the Wyoming Council for the Humanities, enriching lives of Wyoming people through the study of Wyoming history, values, and ideas. In 1911, a nine-year-old girl moved with her family to Fairbanks, Alaska. Fairbanks was then a rough and raw gold rush town, and the only town this girl knew until she left years later to attend college. Alaska and its landscape left its imprint on this young girl. But it's Jackson Hole, Wyoming she's called home for these past 70 years. Join us on Main Street, Wyoming to meet Marty Murray and to discover the story of her renowned efforts to conserve our nation's wilderness. Beautiful bird. The rainy season mist, yellow blossoms never touched by yellow. There goes another big bird bar. <laughs> Marty Murray lives near Moose, Wyoming, nestled in the woods of the Grand Teton National Park. She and her husband, Olas, and their brother and sister, Adolph and Louise Murray, bought this former dude ranch in 1945. I get a kick out of her uh, mentioning some of the people that have been in this cabin for example, presidents of the United States, senators, uh, corporate executives of all stripes. And she doesn't evaluate them on their position, social position. It's whether they're good people or not. That's all that counts. Marty's husband, Olas, has been called the greatest naturalist of this continent. She shared completely in his life, both in the field and later with the Wilderness Society. When Olas died in 1963, Marty dedicated herself to continuing his work. Today, she is called the greatest living inspiration to wilderness preservation in our country. Marty isn't able to go to the Hootenannies at Dornan's anymore, and so the musicians come to Marty's. Every Wednesday night at Marty's, it's Crostics, an elaborate crossword puzzle from the New York Times. Each puzzle uses quotes from famous works with the name of the author spelled out on the left. Quotes from Marty's books have been used several times. Go there, it kind of go there, but there's numbers there, and then those letters go. Listen, I'm not going to try and explain right, it to right. you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's a real orgy here. You know, we have food, and then we. Uh, do a crust stick puzzle and then have dessert and tea. I mean, this is a wild night. These wild nights mean a lot to us. I love her. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. I love her. Marty has been ill this fall, and these evenings with her friends are savored by all of them. A very gentle, powerful person. She's uh, she's convincing, and she believes in what she does so passionately that it it just works for her. Everybody wants to please her. <laughs> I kind of like the way she still inspires the young people. Kids from the Teton Science School come here. 
and uh, send her letters after a year or two talking about how, especially little girls, but not just little girls, but talking about how they want to be like her and they want to do things that she did and she's opened their eyes and what a wonderful person she is. And she is a wonderful person. Well, I grew up knowing her because I grew up within this area. Um, of course, I knew uh, Olus's work. Uh, I was a wildlife biologist myself. And I had just graduated, actually, when I had met her. Um, so I was familiar with his animal track book and their works, but I didn't know about Wapiti Wilderness, and not until I met her that I read uh, that book about Jackson Hole. Marty's written several books, but today books are being written about her. The big thing I always quote her as saying, and she must have said that during some of the time you've been here, that one of the most important things she was ever told, don't ever lose your sense of curiosity. Beauty is a resource in and of itself. I hope that the United States of America is not so rich that she can afford to let these wildernesses pass by, or so poor that she cannot afford to keep them. Marty Neary, December 18, 1995. The year? 1911. Marty, at the age of nine, travels with her mother to Fairbanks, Alaska, where her stepfather is the assistant U.S. attorney. Fairbanks was a rough and rowdy gold mining town. Yeah, 23 saloons, as, as I remember. <laughs> we, we weren't allowed to be on Front Street because that's where all the drunks uh, were. And, <laughs> oh, Fairbanks was a, they were, one element is trying to keep it sweet and kind and quiet, you know, and then the other one was thinking, well, why not have some fun about it? And that's the way it went on. Marty ran errands for her mother with her dog and sled, but stayed away from the part of town which had a fence around it. I remember asking my mother, what's that big fence about? And of course it was about because the ladies of the fourth Row, row, yeah, that was where all the ladies of the night each had their little cabin, you know. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> there, there, was, there was plenty of variety of life up there. Fairbanks was eight days by horse sleigh from the nearest town. Isolated from the rest of the world, the few children in the area were enjoyed by the whole community. That's what what was the reason for it being such a wonderful place for a child to grow up in, really, because there, there was plenty of love and affection and giving, giving and so on, left over for them. And that was just all part of the whole strange network that was part of Fairbanks in those days. There were they were, you know, some of them were just proud of being different than the rest of the whole world. Marty's book, Two in the Far North, tells the story of her growing up in Alaska and eventual marriage to Olas. She writes that one day her next door neighbor, Jesse Rust, came home from work and made an announcement. And he came in the door and said, today I met the man Marty ought to marry. From the beginning, Marty and Olas knew they had something special. It was just sort of a, a, a quiet romance. <laughs> but it was, we, we knew we were walking in, into something. <laughs> in 1924, Marty became the first woman graduate of the University of Alaska. And later that summer, on August 18th, her birthday, she and Olas were married. It didn't happen to be this nice little Episcopal Church at Anvik on the Kobuk. Olas had been doing field work and agreed to meet Marty for their wedding at the church. Marty traveled by steamer with her mother, but Olas arrived late. So we were married at four o'clock in the morning at Anvik in the mission church. We had to say goodbye to mother and 
and my and Elizabeth, my bridesmaid, and yeah, all those folks went on up on the steamer Jacobs back towards civilization, and I, we just waved them by, by like this. Uh, Anvik was a fair-sized village, and, and uh, the, there was a young Eskimo boy who had a, a cabin he would rent to somebody. So we, we rec uh, recognized that we were in luck. <laughs> After a short while in the cabin, Olus and Marty took off on dog sled to complete Olus's work in the field. Olus described Marty as a real sourdough, someone who could take whatever Alaska gave. But one day he was gone well past dark, collecting specimens. Cold and alone in their tent, the new bride began to cry. He found me crying in the sleeping bag, and he thought, oh dear, well, well Marty, here I was, who be acting like a nut in my head. Yes, but it was the but the famous words he gave me at that point said was that, oh my darling, things take longer than you know, you think, you know. That night, Marty came to terms with being a scientist's wife. Well, the affection increased with every day that went by. And so nothing else mattered. Olus's work as a field biologist required that he collect and preserve specimens, in addition to making sketches and detailed records of the areas they traveled. One field assignment he received was to the Old Crow River for purposes of banding geese. All the, world, all the mosquitoes in the world were there, and, uh, they, and not, not nearly as many ducks, geese, and, you know, valuable scientific specimens. <laughs> they weren't as, as, as numerous as somebody had in the biological survey. See, by, by that time, Olus was working for the biological survey, so there was a regular rhythm to our existence. But uh, sometimes we had to, to perform uh, opposite to the written word. <laughs> Accompanying Marty and Olus was their eight-month-old son, Martin, and their old friend, Jesse Rust. For four months, 50 feet of boards and gear would be their home as they traveled up the river, only 80 miles from the Arctic. Well, the Old Crow River is an easy river, just hardly any current in it, so it was easy enough to camp along, and set up a tent every night, and, and Jess had his own tent. But he had a nice tenor voice, and at that time I had more voice than I have now. I guess and he was singing had always been a big part of my life. So that was that was that summer. Jess would be polling with a, with a polling stick, was a regular thing, and, and singing, and I'd be singing along, right sitting right behind him on a bench, <laughs> and mosquitoes. Well, just. That's indescribable. <laughs> it's the most place in, mosquito place in the world, I guess. But by that time, Martin was a little crawling around, you know, he was just having a wonderful time. <laughs>
1927, Olus was sent to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, to make a complete study of the life history of the valley's elk herd, the world's largest. Marty soon joined him with two-year-old Martin and seven-week-old Joanne. Our first winter in, in Jackson Hole was really, it had a chance to be just uh, very unpleasant. But it was a difficult time in that part of the country. Locals felt threatened by the newcomers and didn't like the changes which were happening. It, it, to to all us and to me, that was all a very mysterious idea that you had to, had to act in a certain way to, and this and that. That wasn't, that wasn't their idea of, of life day by day. John D. Rockefeller was slowly buying up available ranches, which he planned to preserve in the national park system. In addition, work was being conducted in preparation for the addition of the northern half of the Grand Teton National Park, which was created two years later in 1929. It was a, a ticklish situation because they were so uh, ridiculously hateful toward, toward the, the people who would come into their valley and it was our, their valley and get out and leave us alone attitude. Marty recalled a ladies' aid meeting she attended at a local church. Local ladies were in the kitchen setting up the eats and looked out and saw, oh, oh there's, a, there's a bunch of those Park Service people. And why do they bother to come down here today? What, what do they want to bother with us for? You, know, I, I remember I stood back and just listen and look and I thought, mercy, this is no way for anybody to live at all. <laughs> Dear. That's the, the way the, the sentiment was in, the, in this valley and in, in that time in, in history. Olus and Marty raised their three children in Jackson while Olus worked on his study of the area's elk herd. And Olus's mother eventually came to live with them. Cute little Norwegian mother. And she just, she just loved being out in the hills and in the, you know, everything, living in a tent and uh, all the things that she, she took as part of the part of the fun of being out in the wilderness with her son, who, oh, goodness. Well, now she was such, she, she was here the last 10 years of her life before she passed away. You get so, you, you, you do follow in a, in a rhythm and kind of every, every summer you're doing something a little different and and of course, the, in, here in Jackson Hole, the, the thing was that you you you, you watched the, the animals and all the animals <laughs> and some more animals, and they had a they would go so we we would set up camp. We liked the camp of, on Whetstone Creek, which is a tributary of Pacific Creek, just right up the road here. By the mid-1940s, Olus had completed his elk study. He decided to quit government service and to enter the struggle to preserve the continent's remaining wilderness. Just one, one more thing that I had learned to do was Greg shorthand and, and uh, see uh, this and that and yeah, all right. <laughs> I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, work. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, boy. <laughs> Marty's early years and books have inspired countless readers, but it is her conservation work of the past decades which has brought her national recognition. How has she done so much? She worked hard at it. For a long time she had uh, uh, correspondence around the world with a couple of hundred people that she kept up with. and. The Murrays have uh, 
inspired so many other biologists, environmentalists, conservationists, wilderness proponents, that they're like uh, her offspring. And there's a constant stream of books that they are writing that come in to this little cabin here. And uh, that keeps her going. And after Olus died, she decided she was going to keep up his work. Because Olus is alive to her. He's alive to her, even though it's been 30 plus years. Quite, quite remarkable. A senator or something asked her why we need wilderness. And um, in essence, she was saying that we all need it. Uh, not any one particular. Um, we don't always have to, to visit it, to utilize it, to understand it or, or need it. But just knowing it's there is enough. Uh, just knowing that wilderness is being preserved and that it's there is enough for all of us. A wonderful, wonderful example of what a human being can be. Uh, you know, someone who is aspire to be like, with tremendous, as I say, this great interest in people and this keen curiosity about everything that she considers worth knowing about. Well, she's 94 years old, and she's dedicated her whole life to the world around her. Marty's efforts to continue Olus's work after his death in 1963 extended to the newly formed Teton Science School just outside of Jackson. In 1973, Marty, her sister Louise, and Louise's husband Adolph gave the Teton Science School their extensive natural history collection. Adolph, a renowned naturalist, was Olus's brother. As far as the Murray collection itself goes, a lot of their items, their specimens, are in the Smithsonian, and then a lot of them are also at University of Alaska. <clears throat> so we have a portion of these. It's yes, it's, it's a very significant collection. The neat thing about it, though, I have to say, is that um, part of the, I guess, the mandate or the instructions from the family is that they wanted the collection to be used and not stored away. It is stored, obviously, to keep it, but not stored away and not touched. So we have a lot of specimens that, that the, the students here actually touch and handle and, and look at. And, and I think that's very significant. In addition to the museum and its artifacts, Marty invites students to her house. The other thing that she shared with them was this ivory collection from St. Lawrence Island. And um, it's a wonderful collection of carvings. And so the kids get to look at that. And then there's cases that have other things around. And, and, um, and they, they, they seem to, they respond so much to her, to her stories that she's telling. And I think what it does for them is that it, it, it shows them what a, a, a life of a field biologist is about and um, what one does when one goes out and, and, and participates in that kind of life. And, the monumental accomplishments, I mean, the things that Olus and Marty and Louise and Aide did were really amazing, and that they too can do it. Well, she's very good with children. She has groups come here to the house, and, and she feeds them cookies and shows them her, her ivory collection and tells them stories. And it's, they, they're always impressed with her, and I think they go away convinced that this is a wonderful lady. We'd like to do some of the kinds of things she does, too. And even if they were not to become field scientists, I think that she's shown them that by looking, by opening your eyes, by, by opening your heart, that you can become knowledgeable and appreciative of the earth and, and, and care, about, care about what happens to it. So she, she's, 
as I'm sure you can tell, I think she has incredible impact on, on students, both youngsters and adults. She's made a lot of difference in my life because she makes me think about, about speaking for things that I care about. I can think of lots of times when people have called up and said, may we please come and have you autograph our book, your book, autograph your book. And she um, was, is always gracious and lets them come even if it's a bad time. And they will stand there and almost invariably will say, you have affected me and I have gone out and tried to do thus and so in my community. She does not tell people what to do, but by her example and by the words she uses and by the way she puts it, somehow you walk away and you think, hmm, I, I, I think I'm going to think more about that, and I think I can make a difference too, in whatever it is. Olis and Marty were instrumental in the creation of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which was created in 1960. She has received numerous awards, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Alaska and the prestigious Audubon Medal. But from everything uh, we've heard and read and she talks about, they were in love. They were a real couple. I love everything about her. I think she's a, a wonderful woman. She's a wonderful environmentalist. She's a great lady. That she is a very gracious, generous, loving human being. Um, which seems like there's fewer and fewer in the world, it seems like. We have a sort of a, I don't want to say we focus, we gather around her, and she is, she's exceptional, that's all. And uh, we're just very lucky to be part of it. Loved and admired across the nation, surrounded by friends, and devoted to educating future generations, Marty Murray lives today as she always has, enjoying each and every moment. Our thanks to Marty for allowing us this time with her, and thanks to you for joining us on Main Street, Wyoming. For a copy of this or any Main Street Wyoming, send a check or money order to Wyoming Public Television or call us at 1-800-495-9788. Please include the subject or broadcast date of the program. The cost of each VHS tape is $20. We accept Visa, MasterCard, and Discover. Main Street Wyoming is made possible by Kennecott Energy Company. Proud to be part of Wyoming's future in the coal and uranium industries, which includes exploration, mining, and production. The Wyoming Council for the Humanities, enriching lives of Wyoming people through the study of Wyoming history, values, and ideas. And by Amoco and its employees, who have contributed to Wyoming's history and continue to be active in Wyoming communities and in the state. Amoco, you expect more from a leader.